Pleasant good evening to all of you that are here tonight. And I tell you, I was again fascinated by that health presentation, weren't you? Mm -hmm. I feel like going out there now and plucking out one of my hairs and having him run it in his computer. <laughs> See what comes up. But uh, yeah, this, it's, it's amazing that um, some of the things that we just use in everyday life, you don't, don't realize these things are actually making it harder for us to get better. Um, and so I'm really looking forward to being able to, uh, you know, talk with uh, Brother Martin and his, his team, his lovely wife is here with him, as well as his nieces, who are here to help us on that health journey as God is concerned about our bodies and our souls. We're also very grateful for those of you that are joining us online. I've had the uh, joy of hearing that there are many who are being uh, streaming in or watching the live stream from all across the nation. And um, we're very thankful that you're joining us at home from the comfort of your home. And please spread the word so that others can participate in our journey through the Bible. Pastor Dave, good to see you tonight. I'm glad you didn't have to hike down through the mud, but you do have questions for us, and we want to get right into it. What's your first question tonight? Okay, question number one. You have talked a lot about surrender and dying and being crucified. How do you die and know you're really dead? Very good question, and I, well, I mentioned it because God talks a lot about it. Um, Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, Paul really deals with that, and that's uh, one of my favorite texts in the Bible. Galatians 2, 20 says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. Mm -hmm. So it's not about us, as many religions would say, you do some mortification of yourself, uh, you cannot crucify yourself. It's physically impossible for you to, uh, to nail yourself fully to a tree. Uh, Paul says, I am crucified with Christ. And um, that is a reality that he embraced. Because Paul writes in another place, when Christ died, we all died. And he says in Romans chapter 6, and we'll get into this next week, then reckon yourselves indeed to be dead uh, to be dead indeed unto sin. So it, it is, a, it's, first of all, it's a decision to embrace this crucifixion of the old man in Christ and to embrace that death so that Christ then can have full and complete control, access to live out his life in you. It's not a one and done. Uh, you're not going to master it right away. It's very unnatural for us to say, not my will, but thine be done. Paul says, I die daily and every day when you wake up in the morning and you surrender yourself to your loving king and he manifests and lives his life out in you, you'll become more and more like Christ, less and less like the old man. Indeed, old things will pass away and all things will become new. So it's not a struggle. It's a surrender of giving yourself as best you understand it right now to the Lord. And he will walk you through this journey until heaven will one day be your home. Good question, though. And what's next, Pastor? Okay, question number two. How can you tell if a minister is a wolf? I've been trying to find a home church, but I'm not sure exactly what to look for. And I am concerned. Yeah, well, yes, indeed. Christ was very concerned about that. Matter of fact, our subjects tonight and Friday night are going to expand greatly on this subject. Uh, and this is one that is critical. You know, Jesus says, uh, and again, I'm going to read this uh, text, especially tonight, uh, tomorrow night, um, that many will say to him in that day, that day, judgment day, Lord, Lord, how did we end up lost? We were good religious people. We, we, we knew all the right words. We would call you Lord. Evidently, they were in church where they were taught about Christ and his crucifixion. How did they end up in the line that was going to lead into hell? And Jesus says, and he was the one warning us, beware of false prophets. And he talks about false Christs. So how do we know? Well, we certainly can't look at them. For Jesus says, and we read it the other night, that Satan can transform himself into an angel of light. He can look as lovely as Jesus, talk as beautiful as our Lord, work many of the same miracles that Christ worked when he was here on earth. You can't look at the minister because the Bible says his ministers are transformed into ministers of righteousness, talking about the devil's ministers. So what then is the acid test? It's found in Isaiah chapter 8, verse 20, something that uh, I had to memorize a long time ago. And that says to the law and to the testimony, meaning the scriptures, if they speak or preach not according to this word, 
It is because there is no light in them. So Jesus, and you'll see that tonight, Jesus, whenever he dealt with the devil and was confronted by Satan, he would always refer to it is written. And we are safe only as we follow our Lord and make sure that whatever and whomever we're listening to is coming from the word of God. You know, I've uh, been in seminars of, of different places around the country, and uh, sometimes people say, Pastor, you go through so many texts in the Bible. And, uh, and I jokingly say to them, don't worry about Pastor Ferguson as long as he's jumping around in the Bible. It's when I jump outside of the Bible that you need to be wary. As long as I'm in these 66 books, we're on solid ground. Would you say amen to that? And so that's the acid test. They could be as friendly. They can have the most wonderful congregation or whatever. But if they speak not according to this word, it's dangerous. And Jesus, uh, Jesus speaks plainly on that. But good question. What's next, Pastor? Question number three. The old law could not save, only condemn. By Christ's blood, did he abolish the law? What is the new covenant? All right. Well, very good question. Indeed, uh, the Bible says very clearly in Romans chapter eight, um, for what God, uh, let me just, uh, let me just read it real fast. Romans chapter eight, because I don't want to misquote it. And since I have a Bible in my hand, I might as well use it. Romans chapter eight speaks to this subject and it says, um, verse three, for what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh. There's, there's plenty of things the law of God, as good as it is, cannot do. God never intended it to do it. What the law could not do in that it is weak through the flesh. It's not a problem with the law. The problem is with our flesh. So God then accomplishes this thing by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. When God works in you, both to will and to do, when Jesus is living in you, the righteousness of the law is fulfilled in us. As we say, not my will, but thine be done. Have thine own way. Christ lives out his life in us, and that very righteousness of the law is fulfilled in us. So a Christian does not have to worry about trying to keep the Ten Commandments in order to be saved. There, you can't keep the law of God perfect enough in order to be saved. You must trust in Christ's righteousness. Would you all agree with that? Christ is our righteousness. We read that last night. Now, when Christ comes in, how will he live? Well, he's going to live the same way he lived when he was here yesterday. How did he live when he was here yesterday? He said, I have kept my father's commandments and abide in his love. So the law is just a guide to the Christian. It's not a ladder. You can't climb your way to heaven. Our ancestors tried it. It was called the Tower of Babel, and they still didn't make it. It's not a ladder. The law is not a ladder to climb up to God. It is a guide to show us where Jesus will walk and where he will not. So I cannot say that Jesus is living in me and I go out here and murder. I cannot say that Jesus is living in me and cheat on my wife. Christ would walk in the law of God when he was here yesterday. He'll do it again today, and he'll do it forever. If you all believe the Bible, then you say amen. amen. So the law is simply a guide to the Christian, not a means of salvation. Christ is our righteousness. But then it shows the Christian who has received Christ what Christ will do when he is living in us. Thank you so much for your questions. I really enjoy them. And when you ask questions, you may even be asking the very question that someone who's a little shyer, uh, would like to know the answer to. So please continue to send them in. Let's bow our heads. Father, as we open up your word tonight, we pray that you will open our hearts to Jesus and his word and the message that you're going to share to, with us about Jesus. And may uh, we be like little children, ready to listen to you, our Father and the great teacher, as the Spirit of God will lead and guide us into all truth. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, remember Revelation, tonight, uh, uh, Revelation chapter 1, verse 1, this is how God introduces his book that he wrote, and by God, I mean God the Father. This is a very special book. It was written by the Father, God the Father. is the only book authored directly by God the Father. 
It is the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. So in the last days, God anticipated that Satan would become a master deceiver. And that if it were possible, he would deceive the very elect. And so he said, I will write the final stages of this road map. I'm going to write a revelation of Jesus Christ, which will show where Christ goes and where he will not go, what he will do and what he will not do, so that my people who are trying to follow him will be able to follow him wheresoever he goes. And in the 12th chapter of this 22 chapter book, God shares something very, uh, very important for his people. He says in Revelation chapter 12 and verse 9, and the great dragon uh, talks about in verse 7 and 8 that there was a war in heaven. Michael, which is another, uh, the, the archangel fought against um, the dragon or the devil. And he threw him out of heaven. Well, verse 9 says that in the great dragon was cast out that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth how much of this planet? The whole world. Ladies and gentlemen, I know we're very sophisticated. I know we're very advanced. I know we have wonderful technology. But Satan has been around thousands and thousands, maybe millions of years and the Bible says that he will deceive the whole world. He was cast out into this earth. This is his home now. He's restricted to this planet. And his angels were cast out with him. And like a desperate suicide bomber, his one aim is to blow up all of us because he knows that his time is short. What will be his manner of deception that will make sure that the entire world, with the exception of those that are strictly, carefully, following the Lamb wherever he goes. Uh, how will he move? Well, Jesus will not leave us in the dark, neither will our Father. In Matthew chapter 24, verse 24, the Bible says, There shall arise, what? That if it were possible, they shall do what? All right, the very elect. Now, we have learned that the revelation of Jesus Christ was given by the Father because Christ is the only way. There is no other way off of planet Earth. With no man comes to the Father, Jesus says, but by me. And, and, and even if you don't know his name, there's no one who's going to step foot in heaven who is not there except by the grace of God worked out through the righteous life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And Satan knows this. And so he says, all right, I can't stop the truth, but what I'll try to do is duplicate it. I, I, I'll set up a false Christ. These are, these are false positives. These are rabbits. And I'll just have them running in front of people and people will just latch on. And hopefully the majority will latch on to the wrong Jesus. The wrong Jesus. This is critical. Christ himself says there are going to arise false versions of me. And if you are lazy and you just sit and just take what a preacher says, hook, line, and sinker, it's very possible that you could be deceived. And you may be saying, well, I, I don't think I could be deceived. Everyone who's deceived thinks they're not being deceived. That is a sign of the person who is being deceived, is that they don't know they're being deceived. Because the moment you know you're being deceived, you're no longer what? Many people are going to wind up with the wrong Jesus. And that's why I appreciate that question that was asked tonight. How do we know? Well, God says, look, I'm going to tell you how do you know whether or not you hooked on to the wrong Jesus. And that's found in our next text, Psalm chapter 38, 138 and verse 2. It says, thou has magnified thy word where? Come on now, everybody. Where did he magnify his word? Above all. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we all know and we believe, I believe the majority of us, if not all of us, are believers in Christ. We know that, they, that under heaven there is not another name higher than the name of Christ. But there is something God has exalted above all his names. 
Yes, that name that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. There's something higher than that. And he has magnified his word above all thy name. Why? Because his word is the, is the acid test on whether or not that Jesus is really Jesus. And you're going to see how critical it is that uh, we, we, we make sure we apply that test to every version of Christ, Christianity, doctrine, truth. We make sure we dip it in the vat of it is written. And if that thing comes out the wrong color, you realize that you have been, that's a deception that you need to let go. So God has magnified thy word above all thy name. You know, I've seen people do it, and I think you have as well. Uh, very rarely has it ever happened to me because I don't have a lot of these. But if people go into a store with a hundred dollar bill, you know, you'll see people, the cashier, they'll either put a little mark on it or they'll hold it up to the what? To the light. Because the light reveals whether or not it's a counterfeit. Jesus is saying, don't just say, I believe in Jesus. And this, hold your version of Jesus up to the light of God's word. And if that Jesus does not line up with every word that God says, that is a false Christ. Jesus says in Revelation chapter 2, verse 2, I know thy works, thy labor, and thy patience. And how thou canst not bear them which are evil, and how thou hast tried them which say they are apostles, and are not, and hast found them liars. Here God is commending people who will respectfully listen to a minister, but if they hear that minister sharing something that is not found in the word of God, they will say that brother, however kind he may be, is a liar, and uh, no intelligent Christian is going to follow a liar into the lake of fire. But as I said, many, of, many people have gotten so lazy today that we don't check. We just say, we plop ourselves down in the seat, we look around, and there's a lot of people here, we say, well, this must be the right place. Well, we've already learned the other night that the majority of people uh, in church the majority are on that broad, easy religion. And that thing goes ever so slightly downward, leading to destruction. And only a few, comparatively, are on that straight, narrow road, which goes up, 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 leading unto life. So you can't look at it and say, well, I can see a lot of people here. You've got to stick with the word of God. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? In thy name cast out devils, in thy name done many wonderful works. These are not the drug dealers saying this. These are folks in church. So how did they end up in this, this line over here going to the left? Well, it is because Satan craftily raised up a false Christianity which teaches you don't need to let Jesus live in you. Just go to church, do good works in his name, and you're going to go to heaven. Oh, and by the way, make sure you put some money in the plate. As long as you put a little money in the plate, as long as you do a few good works and go to church, you're all right. But going to church and doing good works will make you religious, but God has never promised religious people anything at all. Matthew chapter 7, verse 23 says, And then will I profess unto them, I never, what? I didn't ask you to do a bunch of good works. I didn't ask you to put all that money in the plate. Well, that was good. I needed it. We, we, uh, I don't want to be misunderstood. It's needed to help the gospel, but that's not what saves you. What saves you is Christ in you. That is the hope of glory. Come on, say amen. And ladies and gentlemen, it's only when you let Christ live in you that you have the hope of glory. So you in Christ, we've learned this the other night, God put us all in Christ. That's what gives you this natural life. In him, we live and move and have our being. Whether people know it or not, they're alive tonight because they're drawing from the life support system of Christ. We are put in Christ. That's why we're alive, to have a choice to choose ye this day whom ye will serve. But it is when you personally decide to let Christ live in you that you will have the gift of eternal life. And so now we're focusing on, I want Christ to live in me. And I, I, I desperately want to have Christ in me as the hope of glory. Well, what does this Christ look like and how will he operate when he's living in me? Well, in Matthew chapter 4, let's focus on Christ now because he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. I want to show you something fascinating. 
Matthew chapter 4, verse 3, the Bible says, And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command these stones to be made what? All right. And, um, but Jesus answered and said unto him, It is written. It is written. I want you to notice that. He didn't argue with the devil. He just quoted. It is written. What was written? Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. The devil was saying, if you are the son of God, this ought not be too hard for you turning these stones into bread. Prove that you are God. Make yourself a meal. And Christ responded, I don't live by Kentucky Fried Chicken. I live by the word of God. And if the word of God decides that I could, that I'm out here in this desert for 40 days, I will live as long as God uh, desires. You know, the children of Israel ate bread that came down from where? And they drank water that came out of a what? Out of a rock. They lived by the word of God. And so what Jesus was saying, I'm not putting my confidence in physical things. I am depending on every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. That is what a Christian lives by and lives on. Then the devil taken them up again into an exceeding high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them and said unto him, all these things will I give unto thee if thou wilt what? That was the last temptation of Christ in the wilderness. Devil threw off his disguise. He said, all right, I know you know who I am and I know who you are. And I know why you've come. You've come to save this world. But I've read Isaiah, which says that I'm going to I'm going to lacerate your back. I'm going to hang you from a cross. I'm going to snatch your beard out and beat you down and spit on you. But let's make it a deal. You don't have to earn this world and buy it back with blood. Just fall down and worship me and I'll give it to you. Then Jesus saith unto him, get thee hence, Satan. For it is what, my dear friends? Thou shalt worship who? The Lord thy God and him only shalt thou serve. Jesus said, I'm sticking with the word of God and the word of God has declared you only worship the Lord your God and you only serve him. I would rather die, Jesus says, and hang on a cross than to bow down on my knees before someone who is not God. Get away from me. That was the last temptation of Christ in the wilderness. Satan just threw off his disguise and said, we can do this the hard way or we can do it easy. If you just fall down and worship me, I'll give it to you. Now, I want you to notice what Revelation says about the last great temptation to come on the planet. In Revelation chapter 13 and verse 4, the Bible says, and they worshiped what? Which gave power unto the beast. Now, help me remember, my dear friends, who is the dragon? The devil. Whether they realized it or not, this is what they were doing. They worshiped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast. So we're going to get into that next week. And they worshiped the beast. That's verse 4, Revelation 13. This is the same chapter that deals with the mark of the beast. Verse 8, and all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. That's the exception. It is that group of people who are covered in the blood of Jesus, who, are, who have their eyes stayed on Christ, who have Christ in their hearts, who are keeping the faith of Jesus. They are following the lamb wherever he goes. That's the only group. Satan can't get his deadly claws into, but everybody else in his back pocket. And verse 12 says, and he causeth the earth. This is a major move. And them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. Oh, he's going to be identified next week. Verse 15 says, that was, that was verse 12. Now we're in verse 15. He keeps repeating it. God, this, God wrote this letter to us. He is, he is telling us which way to go, and he's telling us which way not to go. Verse 15 says, and he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. So the last 
issue on planet Earth will be over worship. The last temptation of Christ in the wilderness, fall down and worship me. The last temptation to the entire planet, get on your knees and worship me. And the only group that will say, no, sir, will be that group that has Christ living in him, them, which says, it is written, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God in him only shalt thou serve. Now, before God will allow the world to be duped into falling down in front of a dragon, instead of following, falling down and worshiping God, they're gonna, there's going to be a message that God declares would go to the entire world in whatever language we speak. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth. The gospel of Jesus Christ is the foundation of every message that comes from God, saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come, and worship him. Well, which him, Lord? There's a dragon trying to get worship. Then there, which him do we worship? The him that made heaven and earth, the sea, and the fountains of waters. Now God says, I'm going to put a pin on it. Don't just worship anything that wants to be God, calls himself God. Only worship the him that made heaven and earth, the sea, and the fountains of water. Ladies and gentlemen, are, there are some people uh, that are already uh, in heaven right now. They're called the 24 elders. And they were raised up in a special resurrection like Elijah. You know, he was caught up in a chariot and Enoch walked with God. And the Bible says that the four and 20 elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. Why, why is God worthy? For thou hast done what? All things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. These are men of giant intellect. Enoch lived 300 some odd years before he walked into heaven. These are, no, these, these, these are noble men, noble species of humanity, and they will bow down only before their God which created heavens and earth. And so the point that Jesus is making and the elders that are in heaven are making is don't ever, ever worship anyone who didn't make you. If he did not create you, he does not deserve your worship. And, what, and that's the angel's message. Look, folks, I know the dragon. See, I don't want to go too fast. But Revelation 13 talks about worship the dragon, worship the dragon, worship the beast. God says in Revelation 14, don't do that. Worship him. Well, which him, Lord? We, do. we hear this dragon and he's making everybody do it and he's trying to cause people to do it. Who do we worship? God says, worship him that made heaven and earth. And that drives you to the scriptures to find out which God is that and what did he do around that wonderful act? Well, ladies and gentlemen, we know who this God is that made heaven and earth. In John chapter 1, verse 1, the Bible says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word, what? Was God. Ladies and gentlemen, He was God, and all things were made by Him. And without Him was not anything made that was made. Everything created, everything that exists, was made by him who was with God and who was God. But which person of the Godhead is that particularly? Verse 14 says, and the word was made what? And did what? Lived on this planet. So when the angel strikes out on his angelic wings with this voice saying, fear God, means simply respect him and, and give glory to him, worship him, that made heaven and earth, it is a direct reference to worshiping the one who created all things and then became flesh and lived on the very planet he created in order to save us. Now, ladies and gentlemen, which person of the Godhead was with God, was God, and then became a human being? What's his name? 
So this is an appeal for us to worship only who? Jesus Christ and the Father and the Holy Spirit, they're all one together. Worship Jesus Christ because he did not begin in the Bethlehem's manger. He was with God. He was God. He just became flesh in Bethlehem's manger. But he is your, not just your savior, he is your creator. And no one else in heaven and earth deserves your worship but him. Now, let's follow Christ. Don't, let's follow Christ very carefully because we understand the entire world is going to get so deceived on this point that knowingly or unknowingly, the vast majority are going to worship the dragon instead of Christ. Let's focus now on Christ. Let's watch him by faith in the act of creation because he was the most active agent of creation. He is the word that said, let there be, and there was. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, the Bible says, in the beginning, who? Created the heavens and the earth. And we learn now that that is a direct reference speaking about all of them, but the most active agent of creation was whom we now call, what's his name? Jesus Christ. And what did Jesus do when he wanted to make this planet that we call home? The Bible says in verse 3, and God, what? Said. What did he say? Let there be light. And what happened? There was light. And God said, let the dry land appear. And it was so. And he just goes on and on and on and on. And verse 31 says, and God saw everything that he had made. And behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were what day? Now, I want you to notice, ladies and gentlemen, that this world that was created by the word of God, by Jesus Christ, now that we've learned in John chapter 14, this world was created by Christ exclusively. The Bible says he said it, he said it, he made it. He didn't get any help. No angel assisted him. We certainly didn't help him. We didn't show up until like way late in the week to the late on the sixth day of the week. This is God's world. He made everything in it. And that's why he says, if I were hungry and I came to Aztec, I wouldn't even have to. And he would because he's a gentleman. I wouldn't have to ask you for food. I'd just go to your refrigerator and open it because I own this entire planet. And he says, you, I own you. He doesn't lord it over us, but he does. And so Christ did the work of creation. And he finished his work on the sixth day. Now watch him. Very critical. Verse 2 of chapter 2, verse 1 says, Thus the heavens and the earth were what, my dear friends? Now who finished the work of creating the heavens and the earth? Jesus Christ. He started it. He's the Alpha and the Omega. He started it. He finished it. And all the host of them, all the stars, the, sun, the solar system, the moon, etc. Follow Christ now. So thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all the host of them, because the angel in Revelation 14 says, worship him that made heaven and earth, the sea and the fountains of waters. We're watching him now. He's made everything. He's finished. Watch. Verse 2 says, and on the what day? God ended whose work? His work, which he had made. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because that in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. I want you to notice that Christ finished the work of creating this planet that you and I live on, and he did something spectacularly simple but significant on the seventh day of the week. I want you to notice what the, 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 the writer is trying to line up for us. Christ never rests until his work is what? So he started on the first day, let there be light, went on down, land, 
boom, 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 boom. Then he formed man of the dust of the ground, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Man became a living soul. The first man, Adam, out of whom we all came, was created late in the sixth day. When he looked back, he says, oh, I need to do one more thing. I need to give this man a help me. He brought Eve out of her. Then he looked back and says, that's it. It's finished. It's done. Nothing else to do. This is perfect. Now, what does he do? He then, on the next day, the seventh day, he rests on that day from all his work. Now, this is critical. This is not our day of rest. This is God's day of rest. And why is it God's day of rest? Because God did all the what? Work. He said, this is my day. I did all the work. This is my day of rest. Now, is he resting because he's tired? No. He's resting because he's what? Finished. There's nothing left to do. Sit down and enjoy it. And so our very first day, we just... Jesus, you know, and so <clears throat> I don't want to get ahead of here. So Christ never rests until his work is what? So he kept working, 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 working. Didn't rest, didn't rest, didn't rest. But when his work is finished, that is when he rests. And this is the critical point that Christ desperately wants you to see. Christ always rests from his finished work on what day? Whenever you see Christ resting. It means whatever he was working on is now what? Finished. And he always, always rests from his finished work on what day? Seventh day. That's, you're going to see that's critical. Critical. Now Eve sinned, uh, you know, and it gave the fruit to Adam, and Adam sinned and ruined this world, and Christ came back to this planet. After making this world, he comes back now, as the Lamb of God, because he was slain from the foundation of the world, he pledged his life. The Creator says, I'll die for the creature. And now it's time for him to come. And I love the way Paul writes about it to the Hebrew Christians. He said, wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, a body thou hast prepared me. We read in Galatians how God says, in the fullness of time, God sent forth his son. They had a final hug. They shook hands. All right, this is it. We've got to do it. And so Christ allowed his divinity to be wrapped up somehow through the miracle of incarnation into our humanity, put into Mary's womb. God prepared a body for him. Now it's time to become that lamb. This world doesn't need a creator. Now it needs a savior. And it needs the lamb of God to be slain to take away my sins and the sins of the world. And when he says, lo, I come. And the volume of the book is written of me. This book is my story. Search the scriptures and they will testify of me. And if you read from Genesis to Revelation, you'll see Christ moving and how he would operate throughout the history of this planet. And as he comes into verse uh, 8, Psalms 40 and verse 8, which is where this was quoted from, Jesus says, Jesus is actually being quoted by the psalmist, I delight to do thy will, O my God, yea, thy what is within my heart? That law of love. And we learned on the other night that that law of love came from the finger of God. It came from Christ, for Christ was that rock. And as Christ lived on this planet, he operated in that law of love. Everywhere he went, he went about doing good, touching our children, kissing our babies, and healing our sick comforting our mothers-in-law and when he raised up Peter's mother-in-law, opening the eyes of the blind, healing those that were afflicted with all manner of diseases, raising our dead. The law of love was in his heart and it wasn't just a feeling. It was a law for even when he didn't feel like dying, the law of love drove him to Calvary and it made him do what he always wanted to do. And that was become the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. And while he was here on earth, he said, think not that I've come to destroy the law. There's nothing wrong with the law. I didn't come to destroy it. I came to fulfill it. And we learned on the other night, the law has two demands. It makes of humanity. Number one, if you want to live, you must obey the law of God absolutely perfectly from your birth to your last dying breath. 
And because we could not fulfill that, Jesus said, that's why I came. I came to fulfill that requirement on your behalf. And so Christ allowed himself to be tempted in all points like as we are. And where we messed up, he's, he did not so that he could give you credit for his perfect life if you would receive him. But the law also had another demand. If you ever want sin, if you ever drank Drano, you would die. And all of us have sinned. And so the law demands our death. And Jesus said, I came to fulfill that. I didn't die as myself. I never sinned. I have no business dying. But he's hanging from a cross with his tongue swelling in his mouth, hanging from gaping wounds as his crowd mocks as the father abandons him and drives a sword of justice into his breast. Why is he suffering? He's bearing the curse for us. He said, I came to fulfill the demands of the law of God in your behalf. But before he climbed Dead Man's Hill, he had to work out a perfect righteousness, an absolutely perfect record, so that he could give it freely to all of humanity. And how did Jesus walk when he was here on this earth to work out that righteous life? How did he walk? Jesus said already, we know how he walked. He said, I have kept my father's commandments. I abide in his love. That law is a law of love. It drives me to operate the way I do. How did he walk when it comes down to the fourth, first commandment that says, thou shalt have no other gods before me? Well, Jesus said, I, I kept that. I wrote that. And that's why he said when, when Satan tempted him, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God and him what? Only shalt thou serve. How did he walk with that commandment that says, honor your father and your mother? Well, we know how he walked according to that commandment. For even when he was suffering inhuman pain, not just of the body, but he said, my soul is sorrowful even unto death. No human being has ever died at that level. But while he was suffering so much that, that he could hardly feel his physical sufferings. He was suffering in his heart and mind. He looked down and saw his dear mother. She had fainted at the sight of his bruised and bleeding body. She had fainted at the thunder that was being directed at the cross as the judgment of God was directed against us in the person of our representative, and she couldn't take it anymore. She crumbled in a heap at the foot of the cross, and Jesus stopped dying long enough to say, John, Behold your mother. Mother, behold your son. I'm on my way out and I can't give you anything. I don't have an inheritance. I don't have any money. But I will give you eternal life. And he stopped dying long enough to take care of his mother. We know how he walked when it comes to the fifth commandment. How did he walk when it comes to the sixth commandment that says, thou shalt not kill? Well, we know how he walked. When Peter finally realized that Jesus was getting arrested and he was not going to resist, he pulled out a sword to cut somebody's head off and he missed and cut a brother's ear. And Jesus said, put that sword up. If I didn't want to get arrested, they would not be able to touch me. I've got 12,000 angels at my disposal right now. And he reached over and healed that brother's ear with his loving hand. Well, how did he walk when it comes to that fourth commandment that he wrote that says, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. Why? For in, for in six days the Lord made heaven and earth. We read about it already. The sea and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Did he follow that? Well, he did, ladies and gentlemen. In Luke chapter 4, verse 16, the Bible says he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. And that's why when he was here on earth and the Jews, they thought they owned the Sabbath. They, they, I guess they thought they came up with the idea. And they tried to accuse Jesus of breaking his own day. He says, you can't tell me what to do on my day. You know, he was going through the field and the disciples were trying to get a little piece of corn and eat it. And they said, oh, you can't do that on the Sabbath. He says, the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. He's telling the Jews, you didn't invent this. <laughs> this is my day. I made this world in six days and rested on the seventh. You can't tell me what to do on my day. I am the Lord of the Sabbath. So we see how he walked when he was here on earth. And by the way, that sermon that he would preach 
that was being quoted in Luke chapter 4, where he stood up on the Sabbath after working hard in that carpenter's shop, put his tools up on the sixth day and went into church on the Sabbath. When he got up to preach that Sabbath, and the minister gave him the book and said, all right, Jesus, preach to us today. He chose to quote Isaiah, which says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. Jesus is now combining the good news of salvation with his day of rest. How do they go together? You'll see. When Jesus was bearing our sins on the cross, in Matthew, Mark chapter 15 and verse 37, the Bible says, And Jesus cried with a loud voice and did what, my dear friends? He gave it up. And remember, he didn't, he didn't expire. He had to give up his life. Because he never sinned, he had to pour it out unto death. And now when even was come, when did he die? What day? That's what we want to notice now. When even was come, because it was the preparation that is the day when, before the Sabbath. So according to scriptures, according to it is written, Jesus did not die on the Sabbath. He died on the day when, before the Sabbath. Critical. And gave up the ghost on the day before the Sabbath. And then what did he do? He rested in the tomb the Sabbath day, according to the commandment, which is always the seventh day, and very early in the morning, the first day of the week, Jesus rose up from the dead. Now, this is spectacular. This is spectacular. Because we've learned that Christ finished the work of creation on the what day? And then did what on the seventh day? Now we discover that Christ finished the work of salvation on the day before the Sabbath. And then he rests on the tomb on the seventh day. He, and somebody says, but we don't know what day is the Sabbath. Oh, but we do. Everybody knows Jesus died on good what? Rose on Easter what? The only day that comes in between Good Friday and Easter Sunday, we call what? The seventh day of the week. He died on the sixth day. We call it Friday. He arose on Sunday, first day of the week. The only day that comes in between the sixth day and the first day is Saturday, the seventh day. So when Christ finished the work of creation, he rests on the seventh day. When he finished the work of salvation, he rests on the seventh day. And what did we learn about Christ? Christ never rests until his work is what? But whenever you see him resting, it means his work is now what? Finished. And Christ always rests on what day of the week from his finished work? Seventh day. That's his signature. And so, ladies and gentlemen, Paul, who became a Christian after the cross, Paul, who wrote, we're not under the law, we're under grace. Paul wrote, let us therefore fear, lest a promise, you don't have to earn it, you don't have to work it, you don't have to deserve it, it's a promise being left us of entering into his rest. Any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto the Jews, unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, why not? Being not mixed with what? faith in them that heard it. In other words, the gospel was preached, but the Jews didn't believe it. They didn't think he was the son of God. They didn't believe he was the Messiah. They wouldn't put faith in him. And so it didn't help them. But we heard the gospel. We believed it. And now because we believe the work of God is finished, what do we do? The Bible goes on to Paul, wrote, goes on to write, for we which have what? Do what? Enter into rest. As he said, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he spake in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise, and God did rest the what day? From all his works. So here's what Paul is saying. He's, he's saying, in essence, how many of you made yourself? 
You didn't help God make you. God did all that work. You, how many of you save, can save yourself? You didn't help Jesus save you. The Bible says of the people, there were none with him. He trod the wine press alone. So you didn't make yourself. You can't save yourself. Jesus had to do that work. He rests on the seventh day to show you that that's his job. And he finished it. Jesus had to come down and work for 33 and a half years to save you. And he died on the sixth day, rested on the seventh as a sign that now that work is finished. You don't have to earn salvation. You don't have to work for it. It is now a gift. And if you believe it, then Jesus says, sit down and rest. Well, when do we signify that we believe the work is done? Rest with me on my day of rest. And my day of rest is always on the seventh day. So the Sabbath is now, the seventh day Sabbath is not a means of salvation. It is a sign that you really believe Jesus did all the work. Paul says we rest with him on his day of rest because we believe the work is finished. So sit down, son and rest. God always said this. The Jews misunderstood it, and they used this as a way of earning salvation. They think they deserve it, and I'm not picking on anybody. But God always was clear on this. Moreover, Ezekiel 20, verse 12, Old Testament, moreover also I gave them my Sabbaths. These are my days. I did the work. I rest. You can rest with me, but it's like saying it's my birthday. You know, it's my birthday. You can enjoy the birthday with me, but this is my birthday. Jesus is saying, this is my rest, my Sabbath, to be a sign between me and them that they might know that I am the Lord that sanctified them. Verse 20 says, and hallow my Sabbaths, and they shall be a what, my dear friend? A sign between me and you that you may know that I am the Lord who? Uh-huh, that's critical. Because the angel said, worship him that made heaven and earth, the sea and the fountains of water. Do not worship the dragon. He's going to try to be God. He's going to call himself God. He's going to try to make the world think he's God. But when you rest with me on my day of rest because you believe the gospel, it's a sign that I am the Lord, your God. So the sign of Christ in these last days, it's not something that we... Do on our foreheads. The sign of Christ that you believe he is the creator and now the savior. He finished the work of creation and he finished the work of salvation. If you believe it, God says, then rest with me on my day of rest as a sign. It's not earning you anything, but it's a sign that I am the Lord, your God. Somebody say, well, pastor, you're stuck on Saturday. No, I'm not stuck on Saturday. I'm stuck on Jesus. If Jesus rested on Wednesday, that's the day I'd be here. But when you keep your eyes on Jesus, the Bible says there will be a group of people that will follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. How many of you love Jesus Christ? Let me just say amen. amen. How many of you understood the message tonight? I know it's a little long, but how many of you understood it? Praise be to God. Jesus said, you shall know the truth. And I know it's new, and you know, I remember... Uh, my, my, my family members, my you know, aunts and mothers and great, you know, uncles, and they didn't, we didn't know anything about this. We always heard about you know, other days of rest and worship. We're going to deal with that tomorrow night. We, we learned the devil is tricky. But I thank God for Jesus. I thank God for the light. I thank God for the truth. And we'll come back together again on Friday night to deal with the dragon's tail. But I thank God for our lovely Jesus for making a plan of salvation that includes everybody. And I pray that you have embraced him, heart, soul, and mind. Father in heaven, as we conclude our study tonight, we thank you for the work of salvation. We thank you for clear proof that your work for us of working out a, an atonement for our sins, being a sacrifice for our crimes, for giving us a new life. Thank you, Lord, that that work is finished. And how do we know? Because you rested as a sign that whatever you're working on is now finished, it's complete, 
We thank you, Lord, that the last words on the cross that you expressed were, it is finished. And then you bowed your head and rested. You died. May we enter into your day of rest with you. And some are even saying today, Lord, I don't know too much about this resting with God on, on the seventh day of the week. That's all right. I'm so happy, Lord, for, for this coming Sabbath. We're going to have a wonderful opportunity this Saturday to come together and just see what it's like to worship God on the day Jesus worshiped you on when he was here on earth, the day Jesus rested on when he created this world, the day Jesus rested on when he saved the world. We'll have an opportunity to worship with you and to spend time with you on this coming Saturday. And so I pray that you'll bless your people, that you'll keep them, and bring us back on Friday night as we continue to know the truth, and that truth will set us free. We thank you in Jesus' name. Let all of God's people say, Amen. Amen.